morning. Um, welcome to the South Carolina Home Resource Center. My name is Edwina Winter and this is my colleague Kelly Lang and we're both realtors in, in the local community. Um, we both felt there was very little information um, about home ownership and living that wasn't actually related to marketing a specific business. So we set up the South Carolina Home Resource Center. Um, our aim is really to try and be the go-to place for objective and straightforward information that's not actually particularly business specific. Um, and we just want people to be able to learn about all things related to home ownership and, and the local community. And in talking to people and dealing with our real estate transactions, we often find that there's a lot of people who would really benefit from learning a little bit about um, estate planning. And it's not just for old people or wealthy people. Um, today we're talking about topics that are important to people in every age and every stage of life. Um, it's important to plan both in real estate and life. And today we will be covering topics like wills, power of attorney, probate, and much more. Um, We'd like to welcome our guest, Lisa. She is a local attorney with almost 25 years, or right at 25 mm -hmm. years now, right? 25 years of experience and specializes in real estate, estate planning, and probate administration. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Absolutely, thanks for inviting me. Excellent, okay, let's, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get straight on with it. So can we start with the basics? What is estate planning and what should it do? Right, so um, thank you Edwina and Kelly for inviting me to join you guys today. So estate planning is a term that's used to cover both um, planning for after you pass away, what happens to the assets and property you've accumulated during your life, and also advanced directives, which I'm gonna, I'm going to set those aside for a minute because when I say advanced directives, I mean the powers of attorney that you mentioned a living will, and we'll go over those later in the program. But so when I'm using the word estate planning, I'm talking about as you live your life, you accumulate property, whatever you own, and home ownership is, is, a, is an item that triggers the re a real need for estate planning. Then what's, that, what's to happen to that asset after you pass away? And, and what documents do you need in place so that it goes according to your wishes? and whoever's in charge of it is who you want to be in charge of it. So it's that process of planning for after you pass away. Okay, okay. so um, can you explain what a will actually is and why it's important? Sure, so a will is a written document. It uh, is in South Carolina, each person has to have their own. We do not have joint wills for spouses, you have to have your own will. It is a written document. In South Carolina, it has to be witnessed by two witnesses and it has to be notarized. One of those witnesses can be the notary. So that notary can serve as the second witness. Um, and the will establishes who's in charge after you pass away of your property. That's called a personal representative in South Carolina, and so that person is your designated person in charge after you pass away, who takes over collection and payment of bills, establishing of the probate administration if it's needed, transferring property to beneficiaries. This is who is in charge. It's an important part of a will, is designating that personal representative. And then how do you want your property to pass? It describes the the way uh, property will pass to beneficiaries and the contingent plans. Um, you may have an initial plan, well, I want everything to go to my spouse, but the will also addresses what happens if your spouse dies before you? What happens if you die in a common accident? What's your plan B? What's your plan C? And making sure that what's written in that document covers those different scenarios so that under whatever circumstances you end up passing away and whoever is still alive in your family at that time, your property passes to the people that you uh, wish to provide for. And at what age would you suggest somebody get a will? So um, you can do a will at the age of 18. 
um, legally because you are competent then to do a will. Um, age 21 is the youngest I have done a will for someone um, graduating from college, uh, moving into their first home. Uh, at home ownership, if you own a home, you really need to have a will or you need to at least talk with someone about what else you own and, and make sure that it's set up to pass according to your wishes. Um, if you are married, you should have a will. If you have children, you should have a will. So the age is more a factor of your life status and, and place in life and the people you want to protect. Um, even someone who is not married, has no children, um, thinks they don't really own much, needs to have a conversation and consider well, what do they own because sometimes those scenarios are even much harder to find next of kin. Um, if you leave it up the, to the law to decide who gets your property after you're gone or who's in charge after you're gone, in a lot of circumstances it's not who you would want. Um, and let me just give you a, a kind of a basic a scenario that I think surprises people about what the law does if you don't have a will. And that is if you have a family, let's just say typical family, you have a husband and wife and two children, minors, and they own a home. And, um, and have other assets. Let's say they have money in the bank, they have all these other assets. So, um, and I'm gonna put an asterisk by the home ownership because there is one thing we can do to avoid this scenario on a deed, but let's put that aside. Um, if you pass away and you don't have a will, the law will provide that half of your assets go to your spouse and half of your assets go to your children. If your children are minors, they cannot actually own property in their own name, depending on the type and amount of property. Some minor things they can, or lesser amounts, but, um, you know, I, I had a situation, just to give you this example, so I had a couple who owned their home, each owned a half interest because they hadn't done what I'm going to tell you about the deed. They each owned a half interest in their home. The husband passed away. His half interest went half to his wife. She now owns three-fourths of the home. And the 25% interest in the home is now passing to be split among these three minor children. Okay, that is going to cost that family legal fees, probate court fees. Um, it is not what they wanted to happen. They did not want those children to inherit, you know, 11% of this residence. Um, so thinking through this process is, and, and realizing that the law does not do what you would want, um, is a real reason to have, um, to have a will so that you get to determine what the process is and what the contingency plans are. Okay, so I'm assuming that you don't just have to leave, um, property to, um, your family if you wanted to leave it to a charity or friends or something like that that's within within a, your gift to give absolutely and so you know you think about what you own there are there are three ways to pass it to who you want to pass it to during your lifetime you can make gifts you can you can give things to the people that you want to have them right so I always remind people that's that's part of what you can do. You, if, it, if you wanna go ahead and give it, go ahead and give it. Um, and then out after you pass away, you can pass property through probate and through your will. You can give it to charities, family members, um, or friends, you know, whoever you want to benefit. And, and uh, or you can pass things through non-probate ways so let's say you have an account and you want it to pass to the Epworth Children's Home when uh, when you pass away you can set it up to pass automatically to them upon your passing that's something you do through the bank and this the way you set up your 
your accounts as payable on death, or you can make it payable on death to a, to a family member. So there's a lot of creative ways to do it. You can certainly benefit lots of different kinds of people and entities in your life, um, things that are important to you. But the reason estate planning really is important is that you take ownership of what your plans are and you think through them so that you give those directions to your family members or friends afterwards and they aren't left to guess what you wanted. Um, and you have, some, you have some control as to what's gonna happen if you take advantage of the opportunity to set your plan out. Right, right, because say full disclosure, uh, Lisa has helped me put my estate planning in place and uh, I'm very grateful to her for doing that because it makes me feel a lot better. I can put it away and forget about it. But for me, I don't have any particular family here, so, but I do have pets. So we put a provision in my will for um, one of my friends to inherit the dog and the cats if they outlive me and some money to go to the pet trust so that she can take care of them and it's not going to burden her. So I feel much better about that. So I think there are so many things that, that you can do. Right, right. You can be creative. And when I meet with folks, the, the process is at least two appointments because the first appointment is really about what are your goals? What do you own? How, are you t how do you own it? How is it titled? And um, who do you want to benefit? And then the, the contingency question, what happens if that person you want to benefit passes away before you or in a common accident with you? What's your plan B? And that's often when it gets a little more complicated because then the question is, is it a, a list of charities? Is it a nieces and nephews list? Is it a, you know, um, it can get kind of complicated even when you think you have a simple plan. Um, but it's important to talk through all of that and be sure that the will you sign accomplishes the goals you're trying to accomplish. So I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, not, uh, I'm not as versed as Edwina in the estate planning. I have not done That's my estate you're planning. younger than me. Right. I'm bulletproof. <laughs> um, children. So if my, me and my spouse were to pass away, um, can your will dictate what will happen to your child? Yes. You can nominate um, who should be the guardian and an alternate guardian or two alternates um, for your children, minor children, if uh, your spouse has predeceased you or passes at the same time. That is recognized and honored in the probate court process. And when I say guardian, uh, nominating a guardian for your child, that's the person who steps in at, in the parental role signing up um, you know for a camp or signing a health permission this sort of uh, this sort of role in the person's life where they live um, and taking care of them the other part of the will that is standard in, in the wills that I prepare is a is a trust provision for children under a certain age and it can be 18 21 25 you can name the age but let's just say 18 and so this this provision establishes that if the child inherits anything, and that would be in the scenario where you and your husband pass away together, children would inherit things, the trustee would step in and manage the finances of that for the children until they are 18, until each one is 18. And that, that can be fairly simple terms or it can be more complex, but essentially you're protecting the child's where they're going to live and who they, um, who is the parental role and then who has that financial purse strings of their assets for them until they're 18. Those don't have to be the same people, but they can be. Okay. So out of curiosity then, if, if somebody in say Kelly's situation where she has a, a minor child and both you and your husband unfortunately mm -hmm. shuffle off this mortal coil, then if they haven't got a will and haven't designated who the guardian is, what, what then happens? So then a family member has to come forward and petition the court to be appointed, the probate court, to be appointed guardian and to be appointed conservator. So a conservatorship has to be established for the child's assets mm -hmm. and um, then a conservator would manage it and the guardian. And, you know, um, 
sometimes that that is just more expensive and that's the only downside to it but you do have um, the court involvement in the process and if um, extended family have different points of view about what should happen then this is also a point of conflict um, that you could have avoided if you expressed your wishes ahead of time and sort of put those family members in a certain order um, that they may not have put themselves in. Um, and so if you leave it up to who comes forward, you leave it up to what if two people come forward both wanting that job, then the court decides, and it can be actually very um, hurtful in a family yeah. when these tough things have to, be, have to be worked out in a court rather than having them directed ahead of time by the people who care and know the most about their own children and where they would want them to go. Well, I'm guessing it might take a little while to get into court. Right. So what right. happens then? So then, you know, it's just next of kin. I mean, okay. you know, um, and if a, if a family has no next of kin who can take on children, then they would go into DSS custody. But, you know, most of the time there are those family members that step in and take up, take up care of, of minor family members. That's interesting. So it just goes to show how important the will is because it's not just about money it's actually about people's lives so i think that's that's something that people need to to think about really hard right okay well that's that looks fascinating so can you tell us a little bit about what probate is people right. always talk about it's gone to probate or <laughs> as realtors will sometimes sell something in an estate sale that's part of a, a probate right right so probate is um probate administration so this is the administration of a person's assets after they pass away. So think about it this way. When you pass away, you own a certain amount of property that's in your name. It has to be administered through to the beneficiaries. Um, if it was jointly owned, or we'll talk about non-probate, there's some non-probate ways that things pass to beneficiaries, but through probate means it's solely in your name. So. I have a bank account, it's solely in my name, and I pass away, and let's say, being really optimistic here, let's say there's 50,000 in there, because that's, anything 25,000 and over is gonna trigger probate, okay? So I have this pot of money, it goes into a probate estate, it has to be, um, the personal representative has to be appointed to administer that asset there's a process of declaring the inventory, what's in the estate. There's a process of uh, taking in and dealing with any claims if there are final medical bills that be, need to be adjusted or dealt with or paid, um, any other claims that come forward, and then following the terms of the will to distribute that asset out to beneficiaries. Okay, so, um, and then if, um, the court needs to have a hearing, the court can have a hearing. I mean, the probate court is the jurisdiction of this and there is a judge, it is a real court. There are no juries in probate, but there is a judge who's administering the process. So if families don't agree on who's in charge or don't agree on what's to happen or don't agree that that's the last will and testament, um, that's what the probate court is there for and they're supervising the process. Um, the, the probate process does include an accounting of the assets on the inventory through distribution, but beneficiaries can waive that accounting and often in families where there's a clear plan and where families are not feuding, um, the accounting is waived and so there's not always an accounting filed. But it's, that, it's the business side of what happens after you pass away, how to get that property to your beneficiary. I do want to stop though right here but talk about non-probate for a minute because sure. um, what I'm discussing in the probate process is a situation where, like I said, I have a bank account and it's only in my name. That's going to go through my probate, okay? My administration pass according to my will. But if, um, if my bank account is joint with my sister, I use that as an example because it'll lead to a different outcome, all right? If my bank account is joint with my sister, but my will says I leave everything to my husband, whatever's in that bank account is going to my sister. 
automatically right upon my death. Doesn't go through probate, doesn't go according to my will. The will doesn't even pick it up, okay? Because the probate doesn't pick it up. It's happened automatically. So things like joint account ownership, um, provisions in bank or account documents where you direct upon my death, this is payable on death to so-and-so. That's gonna happen automatically, non-probate, outside of the probate process, your will won't touch it. Um, and then, so let me get back to what that, the relevance of home ownership for this issue. Um, home ownership is one of those things where you can own property jointly, and there are multiple ways to own property jointly to keep it out of probate. Most spouses um, or people who own a home together it, under whatever um, arrangement, most of the time want to have that ownership set up as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. And in a deed, that means actually having that language in the deed. It is the exact language you need. It's one of those things where if it's not in there, um, if the property is owned by two people and that magic language is not in there, they each own a half interest and when one of them passes away, a half interest goes through probate, goes through the will, ends up with other people over here. Okay, so, or ends right back up with the person they should have just had it joint with, but it has to go through probate to get there. So, I find people all the time who don't know what their deed says. And it's really important when you own real estate to have that conversation. If you own property jointly with someone and your intent is that when you pass away, they get the whole thing, right? They, they inherit the whole thing, then you need that joint tenants with right of survivorship language in your deed to keep it out of probate and have it go automatically to who you want. It's less expensive for them, it's faster, it's, uh, it's more direct um, and uh, it, it may avoid probate altogether if your other assets are also jointly owned. At least um, sometimes the, uh, for spouses, probate can be avoided altogether because everything's set up jointly or set up with joint tenants and with right of survivorship. And um, it's certainly a gift to that surviving spouse to have less administration in the, in the probate process when you can avoid it with some simple language. I suppose deed. if you don't have that language, you could end up in a situation where the property then goes to somebody else and that somebody else then wants the money. So right. if they want to sell half the house, then, then yes. that must be a nightmare scenario. It is, it is. Joint ownership with people you didn't intend to own property jointly with or as, you know, um, heirs began to own, pro you, then you have cousins and distant cousins owning things together um, and the, the number of people gets larger and larger. It's, it's um, those are very complex ownership problems to untangle for sure. So. And they can take years. Yeah, they can take I years. I know, I've been through one of those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So part of the state planning is avoiding those those complex things that happen unintentionally that lead to these joint ownerships later that are not at all what you would have wanted or intended. Yeah. I'm assuming can rip families apart. As it well. can. It can. You know, it's a, it's a, estate planning is a gift that you give to your beneficiaries and heirs that is a plan. And not having a plan is definitely um, harder on beneficiaries because they don't know what, what the roadmap is. And that sometimes does bring out the conflict. So going back to the will mm -hmm. and how important that is, um, does that have to be written by an attorney? So a will doesn't have to be written by an attorney to be uh, legal. It has to be two witnesses and a notary. It needs some specific language in it about your capacity. And you have to have capacity to do the will. Um, the witnesses cannot be related to you or beneficiaries or related to any of your beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tell people that if they are considering 
printing a will off the internet and at Thanksgiving signing it and having all the family witness it um, that is not going to benefit your family at all if your family are the witnesses um, they can't benefit and if that's who you're trying to benefit you have just so it's that kind of thing we see in because I do probate administration work as well the um, the scenarios where people tried to do a will themselves mm -hmm. and they didn't think through the contingencies or they didn't have the right formalities or they had interested witnesses. Um, and again, it's, it is um, South, in South Carolina. If you pass away in South Carolina, this is your residence. It's South Carolina law that applies. Mm -hmm. So I recommend that you consult with a South Carolina attorney before you sign a will because there are legal implications to what you're doing and if you are just printing something off the internet you may be creating other problems that you aren't anticipating and you might not be accomplishing your goals at all um, and there's a lot out there on the internet that is not South Carolina uh, law applicable right. so um, I know that there's a lot more that goes into the whole estate planning, mm -hmm. but if somebody just wants to do a will, mm -hmm. how much would that cost them? So it varies, of course, from one attorney to the next. Right. Okay, so I can only speak to what I do. The cost for what I call a simple will, and I'll explain that in a minute, it, in my office is between $350 and $600. Okay. And that depends, that is determined and depends on how complicated the plan is. And I don't determine that until after we've met because people will often think, well, I just need a simple will. I just need a simple will. This is going to, I'm going to definitely be in the, I'm going to be the 350. Okay. <laughs> well, then we meet and we start talking about what they own, talking about who they want to protect and the contingencies of, okay, maybe you just have, um, uh, one child and you want to protect that one child and you think, well, that's really simple. But then I ask the question, what happens if that child passes away before you? What happens if you pass away together? And then the family situation is a whole lot more complex and we start to talk about, you know, who you want to benefit in that scenario. And it, and it can become more complex than you think. Yeah. Um, when I talk about a simple will, um, uh, my simple wills include some testamentary trust. We talk about trust for minors. That's standard um, in, in a simple will, in my view. Um, trust for people who have disabilities or special needs so that if they are getting ready to inherit something, the personal representative can divert their inheritance into a special needs trust. To me, that's a standard um, uh, trust within a will. But more complex trust within a will um, can often trigger it into a, um, into a more complex will. For instance, establishing a family trust that is going to last generations and have um, lots of provisions to it, you're then not talking about a simple will. Um, and so uh, in my first meeting with clients, we make the determination of is what you need part of what I do and and that's really the price range that I that I work in and and there are certainly lawyers who who do much more who do tax planning with people at the same time that's going to be more expensive um, because I don't do the tax planning okay okay well that's that's interesting it sounds to me like that's money worth worth spending if mm -hmm. you're um if you're considering a will because there can't be anything worse than thinking that you've actually got it right and you've actually completely messed it up because mm -hmm. that probably causes even more angst in a family then, doesn't it? So, well, it does because what they know, what, they know said, what you wanted. They know what you wanted, but the law isn't enforcing it. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so let's divert a little bit then because we've talked, we've talked a lot about wills and we'll probably think of a couple of other will <laughs> questions yeah. before we finish. But can you, you know, we talked at the beginning that often people consider estate planning to be not just what happens when you die, but mm -hmm. what happens if you find yourself in a coma or 
you want your life to end under certain criteria and things like that. So can you explain about other types of documents that people hear about, like a power of attorney or a living will and what's an advocate compared to an executor, things? That would be a useful thing for you to okay. explain. Okay, sure, sure. So we talked about with wills, the personal representative being appointed after you pass away to govern and administer your estate. Use the word executor. Executor is another name for your personal representative. So that is, those, those terms are interchangeable. Okay. In the power of attorney uh, realm, we're talking about advanced directives. And what this means is right now, while I'm alive, I have control of my body and I have control of my assets, right? I get to decide who I give things to. I get to decide whether I have a surgery or not, whether I take a medicine or if, you know, participate in a, in a medical trial. Those are my decisions for me, my assets, and myself, okay? So the question then is, who do you want to make those decisions for you? Who do you, who do you want to have the power to make those decisions for you um, if you want them to or if you're in a position where you need them to? And so, first of all, there's something called a durable power of attorney, which is a financial power of attorney. Typically, it only addresses um, finances, bank accounts, property, business ownership, contracts. So, if I do a durable power of attorney, I appoint an agent. That's my agent under the durable power of attorney. They can sign my name. They can endorse the back of one of my checks. They can pay my bills or set up a new account, switch my utilities to a different, you know, switch my insurance to a different company. You know, they so can do- they, they become you, basically. They, they can do anything for me that I can do for myself while I'm alive. We're talking about during my lifetime. And a durable, the reason it's durable, that that word means that that agency is a power that's effective now and effective when I become disabled, when I become incompetent. At wherever I am on the scale of competency, this power is durable, okay? It doesn't expire with my competency. It's durable. So um, that's a, hopefully, that I think that word confuses people, but um, the idea is you want to appoint someone who can carry out your financial obligations, buy and sell property in your name when you need them to. Let's say for convenience, if you're out of the country and you, you something is selling that you own, you need someone to sign papers for you, you can do a limited power of attorney for one transaction, or you can do a durable power of attorney that is says, this person can always sign for me. That document gets recorded in the Register of Deeds office in the county where you live, so that if a bank or someone else wants to confirm that this agent has that power, they can confirm it. So that's the financial power of attorney. And I think this is a really smart document to do when you know who you would want to appoint. It's a powerful document. So if you have an agent you want to appoint, this is a smart document to get in place. On the, the worst case scenario um, end of, of this, uh, why you need this document, if you begin to develop dementia or you have an accident and you're in a coma, you know, and all of a sudden or gradually you find yourself not able to conduct your own business, you're now incompetent, um, this person already has the power to pick it up right there. And, and you know, with, with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, this is very often a gradual process someone begins to need a little help with this and then they need a little help with that and then as things progress they need someone to do more and more of their business for them and that's a gradual process. The power of attorney document allows that to happen seamlessly um, for families and alternates in the, in the document to, to work together. If you don't have a durable power of attorney and you need it, um, the alternative, and you, you don't have the competency to sign it anymore. If you've lost your capacity to sign the durable power of attorney, 
then you're back in the probate court, your family's back in the probate court seeking to be appointed conservator, and you have to be declared incompetent for the particular task that they are saying they want to do for you. And that is tricky and, and a very costly and cumbersome process. So um, I think a durable power of attorney, if you have an agent that you trust, and an alternate, name an alternate if you have an alternate, um, to avoid that worst case scenario of having to get a conservatorship established. So that's financial, okay. There is a healthcare advance directive also, and this is a little bit different dis discussion. Healthcare powers of attorney um, only kick in, the, the agent only kicks in to be able to make your healthcare decisions when you are in, unable to make your decisions. So think about it this way. As long as you're able to communicate with your doctor, yes, no, I understand, I don't want the surgery, I do want chemotherapy, I don't, like, as long as you can say what you want in your healthcare decisions, the doctors are gonna honor your decisions about your own healthcare. But when you're not able to communicate for whatever reason, incompetency or, 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 or otherwise, you know, coma is kind of the easiest one to, to wrap your head around, you're not able to express your own wishes, then who are they going to look to to make those decisions for you? And a healthcare power of attorney designates that agent and the order of the alternates for who's gonna make your healthcare decisions for you when you're not able to make them. Um, very important document. It also has some end of life um, expressions of wishes about um, life-sustaining treatment when you're in a, uh, if you're determined to be in a permanent uh, unconscious state, uh, these sorts of things. So there are some specific things that you elect in that document, but you are also appointing an agent just to make decisions. Right. I have to say, say you did all of that, we did that together as part of my estate planning process. And that for me was actually one of the hardest things to think about was, well, at what stage do I want the machine turned off? Do I want to be resuscitated under what circumstances? And I think that's a very important thing to do because I wouldn't want somebody to be trying to second guess what I wanted and nor do I want to be in a permanent vegetative state for 20 years because I don't think that's something that I would want to tolerate either. So for me, that was probably one of the things I had to think about the hardest during, mm -hmm. during the process. Mm -hmm. And so I'll pause here just to recommend a book to you guys that I um, often recommend to clients who struggle with this. And it's called The Conversation. It's a, um, it's a the subtitle is A Revolutionary Plan for End of Life Care. It's by Angelo Blandes, who's an um, emergency room uh, physician. And he gives stories of, of patients in his life that he encountered and how how, whether they had the advanced directives or didn't have them, whether they had talked about them with their family or hadn't talked about it with their family, how the stories played out. Um, you know, I think it's an excellent book on the topic because it's, it's firsthand observations of how this plays out in families. The, the, the lessons from the book are have the conversation. And a lot of times what I provide in the, in, you know, this is, this is a form that you can, you do not have to have an attorney to sign, a healthcare power of attorney. They are offered to people in hospitals, you know, um, or um, nursing homes. They are offered uh, in the military. So wherever you have this conversation, have the conversation not only with someone who can help you with the form, but also with your family. Have the conversation about how your feelings about end of life care. And, um, and then also, um, once you've made choices in a healthcare power of attorney, let your family know what they are so that they don't find out about this after you're gone or when you're in the coma, right? right? That is a really stressful time to find out that your mom or your dad had a certain wish that you didn't know about and you then you really wish you'd talked to them about it right you wish they'd talk to you about it so 
encouraging families to talk is just um, something I do all the time because these conversations are hard and say, use me, use me as a scapegoat. Say, you know, my lawyer said that we need to have this conversation. Just bring it up and talk about it because um, it is a gift to them to know what your wishes were. If, if the worst case scenario happens, and, it, and we know it happens to some people, right? We aren't talking about something that never happens. Well, we all know that we're going to die at some point. So. True, and, and, for, and for many people, they go through uh, final illnesses that are long and debilitating, and, and the medical decisions get harder and harder as things get worse and worse. So this is a tough topic, um, and I, I'm only kind of skimming the top of it here, but healthcare power of attorney is an important document to get in place and also, if you've got, let's say you've got a big family, um, if you're not married but you have, you know, five siblings, no, and your parents are deceased, well then your siblings all have equal or you know, no children. Your siblings, like you have this group of people who who are your next of kin coming in trying to make healthcare decisions. Right. You can imagine them arguing over your bed whilst you're lying there in a coma. Well, and... well people often disagree on these topics about what. And, and then the, they're trying to guess what you wanted. Rank those agents in order. Who is it? And then talk to the person you've named as your agent and say, make sure they kind of get you. Are you someone who always gets a second opinion? And once you get a second opinion, you're, you go with that. Or, or are you someone who gets three opinions? You know, right. what are your, how do you handle your health care? You want your agent to understand your approach to your own health care. Not just healthcare, but end of life. My sister's gonna just be splitting up my stuff and not paying attention to the fact I was dying. <laughs> but you know, the other thing, the other conversation I would recommend is talk to your doctor, talk to your healthcare providers about um, these type forms and decisions, um, and and especially as you, if you get a diagnosis for something that could end in a terminal situation. Have those conversations. Be an advocate for your own information, mm -hmm. and talk to your continue to talk to your family members about your wishes. It just seems to me that it's just so important. We live in a society that is doesn't like to talk about death, but it's part of life, and we have to be prepared for it. And I just feel it's such a, a important topic yeah. that we we must be brave enough to have those conversations. <laughs> Let me mention one other document that I haven't mentioned on advanced directives, and that is a living will. Because a living will, I talk about it in terms of it being kind of a subset of the health care power of attorney. Health care power of attorney covers um, your any kind of health care decision your agent could make for you, including end of life. But a living will is a very specific document in South Carolina. It is a statutory form, um, so you can't change it. If you like it, you sign it. That's what I tell people. I always provide it to people to look at um, because um, it defines a scenario where two physicians certify that you are permanently unconscious or terminally ill and expected to die within a relatively short period of time. And the expression in the document is that you don't want life-sustaining procedures to prolong the dying process. So you're in the dying process, um, uh, but that's a living will. It's called a living will, but the formal title of the document is a declaration of desire for natural death. And that's statutory, statutorily established. Um, and, it, and it overlaps a little with the healthcare power of attorney, but you can have both. You don't have to, but you can. Um, so when you check into the hospital for any sort of procedure, they're going to ask you, do you have a healthcare power of attorney? Do you have a living will? Do you want information about those documents? Okay, that is standard procedure, and that's what they're talking about. Okay. How is that different from like a DNR? So a DNR is a medical order in a medical chart okay. by that the doctor enters into the chart after discussion with the patient or with the healthcare power of attorney agent. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. So there, yeah, there. It's it's part of the process of okay. what uh, what can be entered, but that's not the legal document. Okay. It's the that's medical the medical document. order. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so with a will, I know we're going back to wills. Um, what if somebody needs to change it? Like you get a divorce, or um, right. all of a sudden the way you want your assets to go changes. How would somebody go about changing it? Right. So with the will. The original is really important, and I brought this to remind myself to say this. I recommend clients put their original will in an envelope that looks different, that stands out. This is the original, because the original is what you need to offer into probate after the person dies. So if you no longer like this will, you can shred this will, and it's not in place anymore. Okay. You cannot... I should not, I have had to deal with this before when clients tried this, mark through things and write on it an initial in the, in the uh, margin. No. So it's, no. Better, it's better to rip that one up and start uh, again. Well, if you have a, an attorney that, you, that did your will who can pull it right back up and you say, I need to change this, they can either print out a new one with that change, re-execute it, and whenever we do a new will, I always have a provision in the beginning that says the prior, this revokes all prior wills. So you can, in writing, revoke a prior will, or you can just shred a prior will. Okay. If it can't be found, the presumption is you got rid of it, yeah. right? That's why holding on to the original is so important. Um, but marking through something or adding something in the margin Think about it that that testamentary act, it's your last will and testament, the law says that the it has to be two witnesses and a notary to that act. Mm-hmm. And they have to write and sign an initial. So um, it can have unintended consequences if you don't do it formally. It needs to be formal just like the original will was formal. Um, And it can be an addendum or a codicil, just a little short, say I want to change paragraph two to say this, re-execute just that little addendum and put it with your original, that works, or you can redo the whole thing. So, what if I wanted to leave this particular vase to great Auntie Tilly? What happens then? How do I make sure that jewellery, I mean, some things are precious, aren't they? So how do you... I want this brooch to go to this sibling and this ring to go to this child. And mm-hmm. you, know, you see people squabbling over over furniture and tables and things like that. How do you make sure that rather than everything just gets chopped up and sold or right. they're, they're pulling, they're arguing over the fur coat on the driveway? How do you how do you make sure that you can get specific items to certain people? Right. So personal property is one of the most disputed and fought over issues in probate. It is um, where some of the heart, the worst heartache comes among family members who are left to divide things up. It's, I see it, it's, it's heartbreaking. And so um, what I put into the wills that I draft for people and is allowed in South Carolina is you can authorize In your will, you can authorize yourself to leave a personal property memo. Um, If you were just, if you don't have a will and you were just to make a list of your property and who's supposed to get it and sign the bottom, that has no legal force, right? It's just, you know, if you wished, but it's not enforceable. It doesn't have any legal weight. So if you authorize yourself in your will, to leave that memo and the memo is found, I always recommend that it be put right in that envelope with um, the will, then it is enforceable. It's enforceable because you said in your will, if I leave a memo, I want it followed. Okay, and you you set that out. Um, And um, I always encourage people um, not to leave conflicting memos you change your mind, shred the prior memo, you know, it's this kind of stuff. But that's a very useful tool, especially when, let's say, most of your property you want to go one way. Let's say you you want most of your property divided among your children. Well, then 
but you but you have this thing that came from a certain family line that you want to go to your sister well then you have a way of doing that without having to change your will and also as you accumulate things personal property changes yeah. so you don't have to redo your will every time you just keep track of what you have on the memo and be sure it's with the original will well, that seems like a, a straightforward thing to do. You don't need, need to do it. Right, and right, and and a lot of people intend to do the personal property memos and never get around to them. Yeah, me and Helper, I haven't done mine yet. <laughs> <laughs> typical, very typical. So, um, I actually own property outside of the state of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I own a few houses in the state of Kansas. Um, what happens then if if sure. I were to pass and my husband were to pass, or, you know? Or just I, I own property that's just in my name. What happens right. then? Right. So in if you own prop real real property, let's just talk about it in terms of real estate, yeah. homes or real estate. There, um, it's important to know the rules in that state about is there a way you can own the property and have it titled there so that it passes outside of probate, so that it goes automatically. If your intention is that it would pass to your husband. Is there a way that you can title it there where that happens automatically? Big cost savings if there is, because then not only um, does it keep it from triggering the probate here, but if you own property that has to go through probate in another state, you have to open the probate here where in the state where, and county where you passed away, and then you have to do an ancillary administration and also open something there to transfer the property there. And in, in, in real estate, it often involves getting another attorney involved because uh, property titles and ownership is a very state specific situation. And so I cannot prepare a deed for title in another state. And so, you know, the lawyer there would have to be hired. It gets expensive. So first recommendation is figure out, is there a way to pass it non-probate under the other state's laws so that it happens automatically, but at some point an ancillary administration would have to be done when, uh, when it needs to be sold or passed to multiple people. But you can include all of that in your will. You so should, to yes. To prevent that. That's right, your will should, well, your will could direct where it goes. Right. It may not prevent the ancillary administration, but it would direct what's to happen with that property okay you know um, you can direct the property be sold or you can leave that discretion up to your personal representative to decide what's is it best to sell that property now and distribute the proceeds or you know um, and you may you may want to leave property in another state to a person different than the property you would leave here because they may have an appreciation for it or an ability to enjoy it that not everybody here would so those are, they often go different, pass differently. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that can, anything else that might complicate a will that we haven't talked about? So, um, I think a complicating scenario, um, you, you mentioned about divorce and I didn't answer that directly. Okay. Um, we do have a statute now that um, that recognizes that if someone has been left something as the husband and or a will and then there's a divorce that the the probate court will apply the statute and say well that presumably your wish is changed when you divorced i still recommend people not wait and let that be the determining factor if you have a separation uh, or divorce you're at the point where you know you don't want that um, person to inherit your property, you need to be talking to a lawyer about estate planning um, because that's a significant life change. And anytime you have significant life changes, it's a time to update your estate plan or do it in the first place if you haven't done it. So death of someone who, you're, um, who you've given over charge of everything, well then you, you need to update your plan. So um, that I wanted to mention that. The other thing is people sometimes want to disinherit someone in their family, not treat people equally. 
when you talk about things that can be complicated, um, those scenarios are really important to talk through, I think, with a lawyer and spell out in writing what you're doing. It's another um, situation where whenever you are treating people differently that are of the same relation to you, it's important to have thought through it, be specific, and you know, um, make sure that everything's neat and tidy with the will uh, because those wills sometimes get contested. And don't wait until you don't have the capacity to get to do a will. This is the other thing where I see the most contested situations post, uh, during probate after death is, you know, when, when wills, uh, when some people think, well, some people in the family think you didn't have capacity to make the will. If I have any doubts about capacity, I refer people to get a letter from their doctor as close in time to when we can sign the will as possible because capacity to sign a will. If, if, it, if the court rules after the fact that you didn't have capacity, then the will isn't enforced and um, all that planning for not. So it's important to do it when you're still young enough. To you know, it really is. I mean, that that's really the yeah. idea of it. You think about, you talked about, it's not just for the old and the wealthy. I mean, sometimes the, um, the younger you do it, really, the better. Uh, certainly when you're having these sort of milestones in life with marriage and children and buying a home, or whatever order things happen in for you, those significant milestones are points in time when you should be asking the question, do I need a will? Do I need to change my will? Has something changed about my situation? Um, and, uh, and go ahead and, and do it. Um, as sooner, sooner is better. Yeah, there's no harm in doing it sooner. Yeah. The risk in not doing it soon enough is there, and, and unfortunately- and you don't get what you want out of right. it. Yeah, that's right. very true. Okay, so last question, because yeah. you've, you've, you've given us so much information that we're all sitting here. <laughs> so um, so if, we've, if, we've, if we've got the will and it's now in that nice little envelope, where do you put it? Um, what other documents do you put with it? Sure, sure. So I always recommend people either use a safe deposit box at the bank. That is probably the safest place to put it. You can also designate who has access to that when you set up that box. Um, but at least a fireproof safe of some sort. Um, uh, because if the original is destroyed, and that includes in the fire, well, it's presumed not to be your will, right? So you've got to have that original really important to keep that. There are a few exceptions to that when a copy can be, um, can be administered. Um, it's just an additional hurdle and um, I would not want to be relying on it. Um, so keep that original will in a safe place. Safe deposit box is recommended. The other things you want to keep handy and keep available for your whoever your next of kin is, your personal representative, whoever you've named to be in charge. You know, um, some people do a, a binder of, of their bank accounts and uh, or where do you keep your passwords? Where do you keep these kind of key things? How will they know what life insurance you had? How will they find that? Um, or, you know, investment accounts or old retirement account from a prior job. You know, I'm working with people often in probate and they're trying to figure out, um, especially when it's maybe a little bit, let's say it's a brother who's probating a state for his an estate for his sister. That relationship may not have been one during their lifetime where the sister talked a lot about what she owned or where she kept her assets. Um, and so, you know, the brother is left like waiting for mail to come in, checking with local banks. Did you have an account for my sister? You know, so um, to the extent you can organize things where if your uh, person in charge had to come in and, and know where to start, they'd at least know where to look. Right, um, that's, that's important. Yeah. And they need to know where the safety deposit box is as well. They do, <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do, and you can, um, you can put them on the safe deposit box as a as person with access, um, but there is a statute in South Carolina that says if you present a death certificate to a bank and there's a safe deposit box in that person's name, 
the bank will look in the box for to see if there's an original will. If there is, the bank will often send it directly to the probate court. They don't turn it over necessarily to the person who walks in with the death certificate, but they will at least retrieve an original will when presented with a death certificate and get it to the probate court. But it's, it's better to go ahead and give access to the person you want to have access. That's just easier. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So I have one quick question. Sure. I know that was your final question, but I've got one more. I know you see on like movies and TV shows where you go in for the reading of the will. Is that really a thing? You know, I um, it is, but it's not necessary. Okay. Okay. It's not required by any uh, any law or process. Um, but I occasionally have families that want that done. Okay. And they want to come in and um, have me read the will to the family so they all hear it at the same time. It's not that often. I would say it probably used to be more common than it is now. Now people, you know, will scan in a copy of the will and email it out to all the family members so everybody can read it and they know what it says and there isn't that formality. But, um, but occasionally... Um, especially if family are really spread out and then they are all together at the time of the, the funeral of the wake or whatever, then they will ask to, to for an appointment just for a reading okay. of the will. Um, so that can be done. Okay. The only That's other thing question. I would add is there is a resource through the South Carolina Lieutenant Governor's Office on Aging. You can download this. From the website, if you go to the um, Lieutenant uh, Governor's website, and um, you can download it. I have it in a bound volume. The South Carolina Bar and the Lieutenant Governor's Office on Aging um, updated their South Carolina Senior Citizens Handbook last year. So it's really got good current information in it, and it has sections on estate planning and advanced directives. It also has um, sections on resources that are available all over the state for different kinds of assistance that you might need. Um, you know, Medicare, long-term care, um, all kinds of issues that come up. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, you know, who to contact if. This is a really great resource and you can just download it um, offline or you can ask for a bound copy through the website. So, so we'll make sure we post that on our page afterwards so that people can access that resource. So, well, thank you. Well, I think we've, we're now actually completely bamboozled by all of this information. So thank you so much for that. Sure. That's been really thorough and I think it's given us all, all a lot to think about. So, so thank you, Lisa, for, sure. for sharing so much with us this morning. Can we I really mention one more it. thing that I missed? Of course you one can. One more thing. Titles to vehicles. Okay, vehicles, boats, motors, trailers, things that have these titles. If you put joint ownership on that, be sure to put or between them because the or in that title is that right of survivorship intention. If you have and between your names on a car title, you each own half percent interest in that car and a half interest in that car is going to go through probate and go through that will and and an or okay. that's that's on car titles. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's another good good hint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But thank you. So we're also going to post a little bit of a fact sheet as well on the page. Um, and of course, this recording will be available for people to review because I think we all need to watch it about five times to to pick out all of that good information. Yes, absolutely. Um, once again, I want to thank Great Southern Homes for letting us use this beautiful model in Livingston Place. Um, Please keep checking back for our next webinar. We do one monthly, and we want to bring you um, information that you guys want to hear about. So if you have any suggestions, please let us know. We would love for you to reach out to us. And, and Lisa, thanks again for um, joining us, and thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Thank you.